plenty to talk about and plenty to do so get the gossip get the scoop and tune right into the editorial to keep you in the loop it's the editorial of wichita by ev podcast welcome to the latest edition of the editorial today i have three guests with me jordan and jason rickard from fiorito ristorante bingo and Alex Eftekar from Station 8 Barbecue. How's it going? It's going. Looks like it might go better here in a little bit. Oh, yeah. yeah All right. Uh, we are here inside Station 8 Barbecue. So I don't know if it's going to be echoey in here, but we're just going to make do. And uh, if you're listening at home, I'm sorry. It's something you got to deal with. Or you can stop <laughs> listening, do whatever you want. But uh, welcome, you guys. I guess get the introductions out of the way. Alex, you want to start off? History, all that fun stuff? Uh, Alex Eftekar. I've worked in kitchens around Wichita for... Oh, 10 or 15 years now. Aged myself there a little bit. Uh, opened Station 8 Barbecue a few years ago down here, and it's been going great. Yeah. Um, me and my brother Jason both grew up here. Uh, we both kind of traveled around for a bit. He went to Chicago. I went to Michigan. Then we both cooked in, like, Car- Colorado, Denver, and Boulder for a long time. And then came back here and ultimately opened Fiorito Ristorante, which is, like, our take on contemporary Italian food. And you guys both opened in 2022. Yeah, we actually met just from, like, eating at each other's places. Like, we didn't know. This friendship was born over food for sure. That's how all good friendships should start. Food or drinks. Um, Precursor, I am not a professional interviewer, podcaster, any of that crap. So this could go really bad. I'm very sure. (laughs) All right. So you guys both started in 2022. That's, like, roughly, I mean, you started, what, February, March? March? May. May. So you guys about... Roughly two years after like COVID hit, so things are still on the tail end. Went by really quick, honestly. Like at, at any point before you guys were opening up, were you guys like, "Oh shit!" Like this is like, who who knows that we should be opening a restaurant right now? The nerves were on a little bit for sure. Because you announced yours the year before. Yeah, I had wanted to the year before, and yeah. things just didn't get any better out. Mm-hmm. But we had like a real time crunch of like. We started paying rent three months after we signed our lease. It's like, all right, three months, we got to go. When when you guys, when did you guys sign? Uh, the end of 2021. December, roughly. So it was about five months from, man, that's got to be a, a brutal wait. Well, there's this weird anxiety of, like, you feel like you have so many things to do, but on the individual day, you feel like, well, what am I doing today? Like, I know all these things need to get done, but I'm not doing them this second. Ah. And all you guys have had long tenures in restaurants before. What made you decide to like make that leap and open up your own place? Alex? That's a tough question. You have to answer it. I know I do. It's still a tough question. I don't know. I was, uh, I was kind of doing stuff on my own a little bit anyway and smoking barbecue for the country club I worked at and kind of wanted to build towards this always anyways, I suppose. Uh, my dad's a small business owner. I've always been around people that – entrepreneurship, you know, did their own, had their own businesses and their own thing, and this is kind of what I always wanted to do. Somehow, now it actually is happening. So how long did you work in restaurants until you opened up your own place? Uh, my first job was at Carrabba's. I was 14 years old, actually. Um, I've worked a bunch of different places since then, but I spent seven years at Flint Hills National Country Club, and that really, really molded the love for food and kitchen work. And Was, like, owning a restaurant always like, the end goal, or is it something that kind of evolved over time? kind of evolved over time. I think I saw probably back in 2015 or 16 that I wanted to do this at some point. Uh, I don't know if I really knew it would take off like it has. So mm-hmm. that's, it's been pretty cool to see. So did you have like any formal training, like culinary school or any of that stuff? Or? No, just really on, in the kitchen training. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked for a bunch of really great chefs at Flint Hills over the years and just picked up on stuff here and there. But no, nothing formal, no actual school for it. Jason Jordan? Yeah. Yeah. Where did you go next? You went to culinary school. I went to culinary school. So you're the real deal then. Or in, at and this I table. tell everybody not to go to culinary school. <laughs> <laughs> to you, like pay 24000 a year. Yeah. And that's when I went. Mm-hmm. To then come out and make $12 an hour. Like you're not like an electrician when you're done. You're <laughs> yeah. And, and you, just, you learn so much, I feel like, just working in restaurants. You really do. Being around other people and their creative creativity. and Well, and doing things more than once. Yeah. Like having a guy show you how to break down a fish. You've forgotten that by the end of the day. Oh, yeah. But like. You break down 100 fish, and, like, it's a thing you can do. Like I was reading, like, one class synopsis of a culinary school I was researching, and there was, like, one on, like, making eggs. And they taught you, like, I don't know how many ways, 20-something ways to make eggs and whatnot. And I'm like, do cooks actually use all those, you know, methods? Or No, I mean, they, I mean, yes and no, theoretically, right? But, like, at the end of the day, which I think you're alluding to, like, 
maybe there's a re maybe a, you're a nice egg restaurant, right? And so you use four different techniques, five different techniques, right? All at, at the same place. But realistically, wherever you are, whatever the like egg preparation that you need to learn, like they're going to show you how to do that, right? And that might look different depending on whether it's like a, you know, casual diner or whatever. But that said, like Jordan and I often talk about how like like your your average IHOP has like some of the better egg cookery, right? Because those are the people doing it, right? Mm. Like you know what I mean? Like yeah. you cook a thousand over easy eggs, you're gonna be be really good at it. So what's your background, Jason? Uh, so similar to Jordan's in that. Uh, I moved away. I went to East High, and then I went to school in Chicago, and I thought I wanted to be a lawyer for a while, and I ended up uh, not wanting to do that and trying to explore kind of a different avenue in my life when I was like 24, and I had just moved out to Denver, and my brother had been cooking for a few months or a year or something like that, and he encouraged me to give it a shot because I was going to start kind of like an entry level business job in downtown Denver. And I just like was really, really not stoked about it. Um, and so I got into cooking that way of it being something I enjoyed doing when I was growing up. And then I started as a dishwasher at 24, almost 25. And then, you know, nine years later, opened a restaurant. And here we are like 11 years later or something like that for me. So, so it's possible I could I quit my job. Work as a dishwasher for one of you guys. And oh yeah, own a restaurant over. nine nine years. Yeah, I've well, I've spent a day with you before. You that's, that's, that's you guys do a lot of work and spent the whole. I forgot about that. There's a whole morning. Three, I think it was like from, yeah, morning. something like yeah. that. Oh yeah. I would say that youth is very helpful, and it's no offense to any of us here, but we're all on like kind of the other end of the spectrum. Oh, I think of like being like a real like longevity kind of cook, and mm. so I don't know. I think Alex probably has it harder than the rest of us, but it like wears you down for sure. There's a Bourdain quote that I can't think of right now out of Kitchen Confidential, but he goes through the ages of the line cook. And he's like, man, by 37, he's like, if you're still running your own line, he's like, you're just beat. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I can see that. I hear owning a restaurant ages you like parenting in a way. Oh, the white hairs are crazy. Oh, yeah. There's also like a big stress difference of like, even if you're like, <laughs> uh, like, uh, as executive chef someplace, you have a slow night or whatever, or a slow week, and you're like, yeah, that's kind of how things go. Because at the end of the day, you're still getting paid. But if you own a restaurant and you have a slow week, all of a sudden, part of your brain's like, well, we're, 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 we're doomed. <laughs> like, all right, and, well, this really sucks. <laughs> and your identity kind of extends out to the restaurant a bit, and it's not like, oh, they don't like the restaurant. It's to a degree like, oh, they don't like us. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the guys, the food, because that's the most important of what you guys offer. <laughs> We know you offer barbecue. You offer, what was the ter term, contemporary Italian? Was that what you guys used? Yeah, or? I mean, I feel like there's a lot of cuisines where you either call it modern American or contemporary Italian, or it's just we have our passions and we kind of want to cook what we want. Like, we're within the realm of, like, we're really passionate about bread, fresh pasta, and, like, good technique. But beyond that, we just want to try to, like, use local ingredients and, create stuff that our customers like do you guys hear the i hate the word that people, people always use like the word authentic you know like for me people was like where can you get you know like authentic vietnamese food and knowing from my parents or my mom more specifically like there are different styles you know vietnam still a small country but still relatively big in the north vietnam south vietnam you have different you know cuisines you have different spices you use whatever it is and i'm sure it's the same way you know in italy so do you guys get that a lot like you guys aren't like authentic Italian or you guys should be doing this versus that? Well, so just like hypothetically in what you're talking about, like I, I agree. And I think that like whatever, I mean, everyone has a different knowledge base, right? But depending on what your conception is, it's grounded in something. It's on a trip you took, it's a restaurant you eat at, it's whatever. So then for you, your expectation of what authentic is generally grounded in what do you eat at, what have you experienced, that kind of thing, right? But the idea of chasing authenticity is kind of like a, a like a, a false hope, I guess, because it's just a moment in time, right? So, like, let's say you grew up in one part of Vietnam in the 1980s versus you grew up in a different part of Vietnam and you were born 20 years later. Your conception of what you consider authentic Vietnamese food to be is going to be very different than that, right? And so for us, it's more, like Jordan was saying, a, a, a conception of, technique, effort, the desire to make things from scratch, the desire to have fresh bread and fresh pasta and take basic local fresh seasonal ingredients and turn them into something that's elevated even though it's simple 
And those are all the things that I think are like most Italian. We, I mean, we use a ton of olive oil and stuff too. I mean, there's like other elements to it, but I think that to say any one thing makes something authentic or not authentic is just someone protecting their own, their own conception of what they consider something to be. And that's okay. Like everybody should have their own conception of things, but I don't know if it's good to like exclude others based on like what you find to be Italian or not Italian. And like for the record, like my wife's Italian, Jordan and I are not Italian, we're German something, whatever, from, you know, Wichita, Kansas. And so we like it because we spent years working in Italian kitchens and have a passion for that ethic and that style of food, not because we have some sort of like secret, you know, mystery recipe book that was handed down through the generations, because I think that's more mysticism than anything most of the time. I think, yeah, go, kind of go back to that. For me, as a consumer, I don't care how authentic a place is. The most important thing is like, does the t food taste good? And if it tastes good, that's fine. Like I can go, to, I can go to your restaurant. If you guys had pizza or burritos or sushi in the menu, I'm like, hey, whatever. Let's give it a try and see how they can knock it out. And if it's good, it's good. Well, and even if you like tie it back into barbecue, like if you ask someone from North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, Mississippi, God, is Alex different. doing barbecue right? They're gonna be like, no, that's not how you do barbecue. And my family's been doing it for generations. Like, it's such a convoluted term of like, even with Italian, there are neighborhoods in the touristy areas of Italy where they serve what Americans think Italian food is because that's how they get people in the door. So then you have people from the US who are like, well, when I was in Italy, I had lasagna with ricotta and spaghetti and meatballs. So that's authentic. And it's just a whole weird circle. The barbecue opinions are nuts. I'm blown away. Just, I mean, the different styles and what people come to expect in different states. And, and we're honestly, we're kind of a blend here. I have a vinegar sauce on the menu, but I use sugar in quite a bit of our sauces and rubs. And so you got Kansas City style, you got Memphis style, a little bit of Texas style with all the post oak we burn. But still, everyone will come in and try to compare you to another state or another visit they've had somewhere else. And Some people will message me like, so I saw you wrote something good about Station 8. Like, how does it compare, like, Memphis style or Kansas City style? I'm like, I don't know. I don't care. Yeah. I was like, I like the food. and It's barbecue. Go give it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> you and, might like it. And there are good and bad places in Memphis, in Kansas City. Oh, like, 100%. Like, yeah. like, are you cooking well? Does it taste good? Do your customers like it? Is it fresh? I think that's the most important thing possible with barbecue. You look at these guys in Texas that get that line out the door, and it's like, yeah, the food came off the smoker that morning. It's, it's fresh. It's just been held for you until you get here, and then we cut it in front of you. But you, the places get a bad rap that you can tell are reheating stuff all the time. It's just not how it should be. I admit, sometimes I get barbecue from Dylan's. And our, I mean, nothing wrong jam. with that. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's, it's totally different. Oh, yeah. But it's better than what I can do at home. How hey, authentic those, those, is it, though? Those not, summer <laughs> ribs, they tease you with them outside. It might be, it might be McRib meat. I don't know. <laughs> Hey, so, you, you like the McRib. I, I do love it. It's, it's one of the best sandwiches in the world. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say it on record. <coughs> so this partnership, which is our friendship, where I should say, you guys have d done a lot of collaborations together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like what? That, like use their pasta noodles. That started early on, and it's so well received here. People come Friday and Saturday just because of the Mac. And how did that start? I don't really know at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think just us kind of BSing and hanging out, and it's like, hey, you want some pasta for the mac and cheese? And, and, and you started as a course. special, and then it, you started doing it every week or something yeah. like that. I mean, and now it's like a full year, and I don't know how long of it, but and we never stopped. And sometimes you like br like bring us like family meal over or something, and it's it is crazy how much like like the radiatory noodle we love it. It's a great like sauce catcher, mm -hmm. but I'd never used it in mac and cheese before. And then when we eat the food that's with our pasta, I'm like. This is amazing because it's like a cheese bomb every oh, time you dude, bite yeah. into one of them. It soaks up so much of it. It holds so much of the sauce. It's unreal. That's the same noodles that we just had the other, the other day? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Oh, family loved that stuff. That was really good. We have a guy that comes in here and he always says, you know, I, I like to think about coming down Wednesday and Thursday, but Friday's fancy noodle Friday. And I can't miss that. <laughs> <laughs> His name's John. He's a good dude. But. And how have you incorporated Station 8's? Uh, we've run features before. We also did oh, yeah. a full like barbecue whiskey dinner, which I don't know. I had a blast with. That was like, fun. We did like Giant baked, short baked ribs. bean stuffed pasta and short ribs, and uh, we gave him cauliflower, and he just gave it like the full barbecue treatment. That might have been my favorite course, just because it, it was, was like, really good. It was really good. You wouldn't be like, oh, the vegetarian course was the cool one, but and those <laughs> dinners, you guys have had multiple dinners. Yeah, you we, had like, the vegan one. We do one one it. a month. Okay. How do people find about that? Just off your Facebook page? Yeah. Uh, 
So yeah, it's on our Facebook page, uh, Instagram. Sometimes I put it on that food and booze group. Um, and then uh, if you go to our website or in our restaurant, you can sign up for our, like newsletter or frequent customer type thing. And then you'll get an email about them with information and that kind of thing. Well, and but that's what, oh, sorry. I was going to say generally though, it's one Tuesday a month. Yeah, and I was just going to say, awesome. that's the best part about like cross promoting with other local businesses mm -hmm. of like, if White Crow is definitely going to send some people our way who may have never heard of us or never been in. And if we can get some of our customers to try their cider or like vice versa with if Alex's customers yeah. like the mac and cheese so much that they come into our restaurant or if they try a, a special that we run with his brisket and they go to him, awesome. Everybody wins. When would you guys start doing the dinners? Mm. Pretty early on. Last November, I think. Yeah. I think it's been a little over a year. Yeah. Any favorite ones that stuck out? Honestly, a lot of them are kind of a blur at this yeah. point. <laughs> but uh, some of the vegan dinners are the most fun for me just because it's kind of cool to cook within confines of mm -hmm. like, instead of just, oh, cook whatever you want. It's like, well, how do we make, I have, my palate is geared towards meat and barbecue and all these things. So how do we make food that is like comparably delicious, but like using different ingredients and in a way that Wichita diners are going to come and eat it. I think one thing you guys have mentioned multiple times is the whole fresh food concept. You know, things come in like straight from the smoker or just freshly made, homemade, whatever. How time consuming is that compared to like, like a national chain doing whatever, you know, pre-processed stuff? <coughs> it's pretty time consuming. It's definitely time consuming. Yeah. Like, I don't know if, while I was here at Station A, I think started at 3.30 up until 11. Yeah, and honestly, it's still, I mean, it's, it's inactive, but the food starts cooking at about 2.30 or 3 p.m., mm -hmm. And then every couple hours, I'll stoke the fire, throw a log on, whatever, just fire management. I mean, but, you guys, like, do all your handmade noodles and whatnot. Like, how long, how long does that even take? I don't even know. So ours is more of, a, like, a rolling process of we got to be looking at, like, what we're going to need for – we need – I need to get bacon and cure for what I need for a week from now. We need to have pasta ready for tomorrow. And once you get into the system, it's not that bad. But all of a sudden, if you have new staff member or someone who's not quite on board yet, and you're like – oh, it's Friday, and their station is tanked because they haven't been, like, preemptively prepping. Because that's the only way to, like, put as much, like, labor into yeah. the product and not have it be a nightmare. But, but, like, short answer, right? So, like, if you got a stuffed pasta, theoretically, it's like, well, somebody cracked 150 eggs, separated 150 egg yolks, mixed that in a big mixing bowl with a bunch of flour, rested it, shaped it into dough, uh, you know, et cetera. Then they took it in small chunks, sheeted it out probably 10, 15 times in a row in order to get it edge to edge, nice sheet, et cetera, then filling. And then you have to think about, well, let's say the filling took an hour to make, right? So that's another built-in step right there. So the stuffed pasta alone has three or four hours of time in it, just as if you were to make it at home. But as Jordan's saying, the thing that's like important to like what we do versus like Alex is doing fresh every day, making the same like large amount of barbecue product, I'm assuming to a certain degree. Um, anyway, let's say we're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum in a way of like, we make pastas in the pan to order and you can't really do that with barbecue because it's a, such a long process. But then if you're not doing it every day and you're serving two day old barbecue, it's very evident in the product. Oh yeah. I would say the bread is the more similar part in that. Like we make <coughs> the same amount of bread. Well, not the same amount, but we make two or three types of fresh bread every day. And that's what gets used in the sandwiches and in our dinner entrees and everything. And then the next day, we make fresh bread again, regardless. Just like Alex always does fresh barbecue. He's not saving the bread from the day before and then reusing it. Because we believe in the idea of like the, the value being in that this came out of the oven recently. And now it's being served to you kind of thing. And there's an, a significant cost. Not just time, but just the quality of food when you're making stuff fresh versus pre-made stuff. And that's reflected in the price, too. Because uh, I see a lot of the big comments these days. I mean, it's it's every place. Like, oh, that place is too expensive. I'm not going there. I can get, I can make it at home for cheaper. Well, no shit. I mean, you're you're making it at home. But if you go out to eat somewhere, you're paying for not just the food. You're paying for the labor, the cost, the time, to also to make it. To not be the guy standing by the smoker all night long. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and the level of skill that's involved. Mm -hmm. Like, I know all the big distributors, and because they try to sell them to us of like pre-sauced, pre-panned pulled pork. All you got to do is thaw it and throw it in. And if you, and it probably isn't, it's probably almost cheaper than buying whole cuts. 
but it's not going to be as good and it's not going to be fresh and someone could buy it and open a subpar barbecue restaurant and sell it with you know buns but it's not the same do you guys ever have people come in and just complain about the price to you guys oh yeah it cracks us up here because it's like you have your menu down here you stared at it the whole time then you get to the boards because there's chalkboards in here and again the menu and the prices but they'll get all the way to the front and be like that's how much goodness it's like yeah i mean everything's gotten really high it sucks but you also (laughs) read the menu the whole way to the front well, and especially early on, we had a lot of people coming in expect looking for a Two Brothers barbecue. Mm-hmm. And then we were like, it's Italian. They're like, <laughs> oh, all right. I guess we'll check the menu out. Mm-hmm. And then not all of them, but a decent amount of them would be like, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't the kind of Italian we're looking for. And, and no, people don't usually say that it's too expensive, or at least not directly. They say it's too expensive in writing reviews or saying things like the nature of like, well, the bread's not free and that kind of stuff, right? And so I think that it's like, well, when you're like talking to the guy who, you know, spends his whole day making fresh bread, the idea of giving it away for free seems kind of like a, you know, unfair one to us sort of thing. And then, or people say things like, you know, and there was no bread. And it's like, well, if you don't order bread, like, you know what I mean? And so it just depends on it. But like, you know, for us, it's something that we do spend a lot of time and labor and effort into, and we find to be like one of the most important products that we serve and so it's not something that like we want to give away and so i think that's something that sometimes comes off as like expensive to some people for sure i think people are just preconditioned um like they're very price conscious about things they go they grew up you know going like olive garden getting free bread grew up going like on the border and getting free salsa at a mexican restaurant or i can't even think of any other examples but just or dollar tacos even at mexican places no like they see a place that sells tacos for a dollar, and then a new place opens up, and they sell for like three or four dollars. Quality could be higher, the rent could be higher somewhere else, but this, they always kind of know what they're used to. Now, I saw someone post this morning. They said, "I don't go out to eat to burger places very much because I find all the places to be expensive." And then, and then she starts talking about a restaurant she went to in the '70s, and I'm thinking, "Well, of course it was cheaper in the '70s." Yeah. <laughs> but uh, then I'm like, "How much? What, what's expensive?" What's, a, what's, what's an expensive burger to you? She said, I think like $9 or something like that. But I feel like we're at a, a level where the average price of a sandwich and a meal is going to be around $10. And that's just the future of things. Uh, the burger price would be like $9. And all of it's still so recent. It's crazy to think like inside that diner, the menu board is up, <clears throat> I think, from only two years ago or something mm-hmm. like that. And you look at it and it's like, huh, that is really cheap. And you read like everything in there is like four or five bucks, six yeah. bucks. It's like, no, everything has jumped drastically since COVID. Yeah, I remember when Dempsey's Burger Pub opened up over in um, Clifton Square, and their burgers were around $9. And this was probably back in 2017, 2016. I don't even remember when it was. But everybody balked at the, the burger prices. And I think the only other place in town or that people knew of that sold burgers out high was Burger Fi out in New Market. So when they came in town also, their burgers were around 9 $10. And people weren't used to that. But now we're seeing, you know, a lot of places are starting to like get to that price point where, yeah, burgers don't cost around ten bucks. Beef in general is just, it's, it's. I mean, it's literally. I think back to I worked in a butcher shop in 2020 for a while, and I think we were paying like a dollar eighty a pound for brisket, and like we were talking about just 20 minutes ago or so, brisket's mm-hmm. over five bucks a pound right now for the for the prime for the good stuff. Yeah, so I definitely encourage people to, you know, try to make all the stuff yourself, especially when you're like smoking food or, I smoke food at home and the sheer number of hours it takes to do it. I'm waking up sometimes at 4 in the morning. It's fun, though, Start too. up. It's fun. It's fun. Until the end of the day hits and you're tired. Yeah. And you have a kid that won't go to bed. And you're, you have all these things, chores you have to do at home. Clean the house up. It's just, yeah, I'm out. Not <laughs> that. Well, and while we got a soapbox, just so everyone knows, there's no such thing as free bread or free chips and salsas. <laughs> it's not like the owners are just eating the cost of that. It's reflected in the menu prices everywhere. Yeah. Like, Oh, usually a treat. It's, it's 20, never free. $22 fettuccine Alfredo at Olive Garden. Uh-huh. It's in there. What kind of trolls do you guys get? What, like, what negative feedback have you seen that you're like, why is this even come my way? I saw one for you. Some gentleman complained about, was it the grease? Yeah, he said the brisket was fatty. Really fatty. And then you offered to replace it for him or even deliver it at one point. That guy was having a bad day. And he was having a really bad day. He did not want to have anything of it. And no, he, he let he you know. Not. And the world know what he thought. It's just like, is this something that happens <coughs> quite often to y'all? No, I wouldn't say often. But it uh, sticks out. But yeah, I yeah. Mean, we, we, oh, def- we, we absolutely remember the ones, you know. Yeah. 
I, I got one in my head specifically that cracked us up because he was like, took us outside and wanted to talk about the wood and had advice. And I was like, well, did you like everything today? And he's like, well, if I had done it my way, I would have done. And then gave us <laughs> got a long ramble again. I mean, there's funny people, but it does. I wouldn't say that it's all the time or anything yeah. like that. Well, and this was at a different restaurant, but I just remember the bluntness of this. Like, I did a wine dinner and handmade porchetta with braised local greens, and it was like a labor-intensive, like, nice dish. And a guy just looked at me point blank and said, instead of greens, it should have been risotto. And I was like, why? Because you like risotto, or that's how these dinners usually go for you? or But just like, no, oh, no, the best way is the way I like it. <laughs> What other struggles do you guys have? Staffing? You guys pretty good on staffing? Is, is it hard to find work out there for y'all? It's easy to find people. It's hard to find the right people. I think we both have pretty awesome. I mean, for the most part, meeting some of the guys at your place, we both have really awesome, dedicated employees that definitely make the place. But yeah, it's still tough. I have a hard time with it just because of the hours here starting so early. Well, and we also live in a world where if you want to get a uh, – hotel job or a corporate job there's always gonna be people that can pay better than us it's hard to find people that are like motivated by like the craft and Mm -hmm. the product and the environment and they're having fun with it they really want to be yeah yeah they want to enjoy their life at work not just be miserable at work make enough money and then go home and chill yeah and i think the the hard part is developing culture it's like we have an amazing staff and we have a core group of like four or five individuals who have been with us since like day one, right? And we have new people who have come in the last, you know, couple of years and, and replaced and added and that kind of thing. But I would say that like today, more so than ever, like the health of our team is good. And like that's what we want. And I think that it's a two way street too, though, of like Alex with his staff and we with our staff. Like we're like working with them and trying to pay them as well as we can, trying to like reinforce the things that like make it a good restaurant to work at you know what i mean good food to eat good food to serve to others hospitality you know being happy about where you work taking pride in where you work like and those are things that think i think take time to develop and so i don't know i would say that's like staffing wise like you know the the hard part is getting to that point and once you get there it's a little easier maybe to find staff i think that can kind of fit in when needed you know what i mean Touching on pride, I love going into your place when we come to pick up pasta because someone's always like, Aaron's like, come check out this bread. Like, I changed it a little bit. This is what I did to it today. I mean, it'll be the best thing you've ever had. The focaccia is what I'm personally thinking of. But someone's always excited to show me whatever they've been working on. Right, and that's what makes it so cool, like, having having a a restaurant like ours is there is, like, Aaron's a great example. But, like, we have a lot of great examples of of staff who are just, you know, really, like, excited about what they're working on, the next dessert, the next pasta shape the next whatever and we really want to encourage people to take that kind of artistic license and work on things and do fun things and like work on specials and menus that mean something to them and not just to us because like at the end of the day we want to kind of like you know help gently lead the ship or whatever but it doesn't have to be like you know exactly what we want or exactly our 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 dishes or menu or whatever we just kind of want it to be a a good environment and a, a good place for people to enjoy. An extension of your guys' staff is your family. I know both you guys have your parents at your places every now and then doing whatever. What's, oh, that, yeah. what's that like? My dad's bored. He loves hanging around in here. <laughs> he's he, always out there greeting people. He really enjoys it. I mean, he, 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 he's, not, he's never worked in a restaurant. He's probably never had that amount of traffic all day long. So I, I think for a while it took him a little bit to get used to talking mm-hmm. to that many people and saying hi that many times. Yeah. But he, you can tell he loves it. Mm-hmm. And their mom is the sweetest woman in the world. I love going in there and getting gre- greeted She's by still her. help host? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I also think, it, like, it'd be nice if everyone could work in a restaurant for at least a little while just oh, for yeah. perspective because it's kind of grounding. And I think it's been, like, good for my mom in general but, like, it is funny to see the influence back and forth of, like, growing up, my mom was, like, never swore, never foul language, really on us about it. And the other day, she was, I was in her car, and she was like, I came in yesterday, and the linens were all fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's new. <laughs> but, yeah, our, our, our mom, uh, our mom works, works a lot in, in the restaurant, and she loves doing so. She requests to work. She's like, oh, I want to work yeah. Friday night because Friday night's when I get to see my friends. Mm-hmm. Like, and so whatever she does, she does because she wants to do it. But at the end of the day, it is really helpful to us, and that's awesome. And she's, she's so proud of you guys. I always love like, that. Did you, too, did you see what they too. did last week? 
Well, did you see what the special was? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did. Sorry if it's too much, folks. The, the, the amount <laughs> of customers that we get who are like, oh, I was talking to your dad, and that's why I'm here. Or your mom was talking you guys up. And, like, it's very sweet. And It is. It's cool. I mean, I think I went for lunch one day, and your dad was there, and I sat next to him. We just struck up a good, cool conversation. You could tell he's incredibly proud of you all. Wish my parents could say the same thing about me. Oh. I'm, to- I'm totally, <laughs> kidding. totally kidding. In case you're listening to this, totally kidding. <laughs> So do you find like the customers are in a better mood to see like a parental figure at the front versus like a 15 year old kid or a 20 year old person, you know, we're really loud with everyone as far as like greeting them and talking to them and trying to make people laugh. Mm-hmm. So I, I think we're almost exempt from that. But yeah, I think, I think there is a bit of a difference. You can tell when the person cares when you walk in and they're like excited that you're here or yeah. if they're just like, Oh great. I have to do my job real yeah. quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do think that both, both, uh, both your parents and, and, and my mom and, dad have you know a, a presence right in the restaurant and i think that that can be a really cool thing it's right? warming it is yeah. yeah well and when you get into like nicer restaurants and fine dining the first <coughs> face you see when you come in the door is a mater d yeah not like a high school student who is like still developing mm-hmm. social interactions yeah. like the amount of places i've been in wichita where i get met with like deer in the headlights and yeah like, right this way i was just in a restaurant in kansas city and the person at the front who greeted us, like, totally, like, socially awkward. Didn't, I don't think she felt comfortable talking to people and just fumbled her words. It could have been a first day. I don't know. But I'm just saying it, it made me think about that. And it's funny, too, though. I mean, I can remember a time where I probably stuttered a little more than I should, like, serving when my, one of still my do. first serving shifts. Yeah, it's like, I mean, you do get over it eventually. Some people don't. Some people just don't enjoy that in general. But for the most part, you do it a few times, and all of a sudden it's easy. You guys are both pretty customer facing like you're all you're out there oh, yeah. talking with, that's cool is that something you've always done at past restaurants or just because now you guys own the place you're able to i've always i've always been pretty talkative with the customers at at flint hills we always had to go touch tables as they say and check on everyone and see how everything is so i think that's probably that was a big part of it because now i'm just used to doing that because of mm-hmm. course you also want to know how everything was like I would say it's, but it's to some degree, I mean, you agree, it's like a managerial privilege kind of thing, though, too. Like, a lot of the times, like, if you're, like, the guy cooking the steak, you never get to find out. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Did like, they like you it? You no, just I stand so. back there sort you're of thing. You're in the kitchen quite a bit, aren't you? Yeah. But he comes but, out quite yeah. a bit, too, though. When there's, I get both sides of the stick. If there's, like, a problem or a compliment, I like to try to touch the mm-hmm. table. But I think it also, like, humanizes both sides of the interaction. Like, when the customer's people, you're not just getting mad at, like, tickets all day. And it, when they realize that there's a real human cooking their food back there, if there was a slight mistake or something, it's less of a freak out situation and more like, well, he seems like a nice guy, I hope. So you guys are both close to two years of owning the restaurants. What's we been have a party? What's yeah, what's what's your favorite thing you've it's agreed? You agree well, what's your favorite thing <laughs> over the past two years? Like what have you learned the most? If you haven't learned anything, you can say that too. I mean, okay, yeah, I've learned a lot. I'm trying to think of one thing in particular. Well, Honestly, I, not to answer for both of us, but I think me and Jason have really learned how, like, the most important thing is family. And I think we've really learned how to interact with each other. Because when you're just, like, for, like friends, effectively, your interactions are very tertiary. You're laughing. But, like, it's been an ordeal. But we've made a lot of progress of, like, learning how to, like, tackle serious issues and, like, tough times together. And, like, how to, like, communicate in a way where we're not as much as this might contradict just talking over each other all the time. Yeah, I would say that that's true. I mean, like, Jordan and I have an exceptionally weird journey. Like, we're, we're less than a year apart. We used to, like, play doubles together in high school. <laughs> doubles uh, what? Tennis? In tennis, yeah. yeah. So uh, we've had, like, yeah, and we and we could literally be, like, having, like, oh, we're going to win the tournament, no problem. And then, like, we'd have, like, a, like a hissy fit in, like, the semifinals and start fighting about some bullshit and, like, <laughs> throw the whole thing. <laughs> and so that's... You can't do that when it's the business. It's like we're married now or yeah. something, right? Where it's just like there's too much on the line for one of us to be like, I quit. And so not that that like as, is, has been a thought recently, but I'm sure it's a thought we both had at some point in the last two years of like, I don't know about today. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And so overall, I'm glad that we're both here and that we made it. And we're certainly, I think, truly like stronger than ever in that sense. But it was a test, right, of that relationship. It's a test of the relationship with our mom sometimes of when it's like we're literally out at, we were at Livingston's in the morning having breakfast and all of a sudden we're just like talking about work for no reason, yeah. right? You know? And so that's the thing too is like, it is good to kind of like weave work throughout your life 
and if a way you can like find a way to balance it but i think sometimes too when it's like your your family and your and your my my, my wife helps at the restaurant a lot too rachel's like hugely instrumental and so it's kind of like everybody has this one easy topic of conversation. So it becomes easy for that to be like the only thing you do, think about, talk about, whatever. And, you know, I'm, I don't think that's probably generally good, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I hear that. That's yeah. all anyone wants to talk about anymore. Yeah, Which we, it's not a bad thing, of course, but it's also just like, where's the escape from work? <laughs> yeah, right. When is when's the when actual you go out, thing? The question is always like, well, how's the restaurant going? Oh, blah, blah, the first, first or thing. they ask like barbecue tips or whatever. Oh, yeah. Okay. I love the barbecue tips. I love talking yeah. barbecue for the most part. Just not uh, business side of things. Yeah, just not the business side of things. Yeah. I had a weird wave of stress when we first got here, and I watched you walk down from upstairs. Of like, <laughs> oh, I can't imagine if I lived above the restaurant. <laughs> I do. I definitely like have to leave at the end of the day for at least a half hour or something. Because yeah, otherwise I am quite literally always here. But, which is a good thing for the barbecue, but it's also uh, not so good thing sometimes for your mental well, well-being. Yeah. But with your smoke schedule outside, wouldn't it be imp impossible for you to not be here all the time? You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, so, someone has to be here. Yeah. Um, I haven't really found that person yet because, of course, the shift sucks. I mean, hey, can you come work from like <coughs> 6 to 3 or 4 in the morning? It's like, no, nobody's really that excited about that. Listeners, it's probably an amazing job. Apply. I mean, yeah, it's a fun yeah. job. Yeah, believe yeah. me, I'll yeah, feed you well. Yeah, sell it right. But <laughs> no, I get it. I work from home, so like I'm there all all day long, and sometimes when 5 or 6 o'clock hits, I'm like, I got to get away for a little bit. Yeah. Even, even if it's to Dillon's or Target, wherever, get gas. I'll drive around the block. Yeah. We all agree Gucci Dillon's is awesome. I used to be a Gucci Dillon's guy, but I moved out west, oh, so oh, I'm, oh. I really miss it. I went by, I saw the remodel, the renovation, the new floors. Super jealous of y'all. Yeah, well, the screens on those fridges are stupid, but the cheese and everything else is amazing still. <laughs> when I was single living out East, funny story, I uh, I went to school near there, so I'd always run into, like, friends' parents and whatnot. You know, single, and sometimes they'd be like, hey, you should come on over for dinner tonight if you have nothing going on. I'm like, this is awesome. I was like, I'm gonna <laughs> I just stopped by Dylan's to get invited to free meals at my friends' parents' houses, so... No, that's, that's uh, best Dylan's in Wichita. It's definitely a social hangout, too. It cracks, it is. cracks me up. Well, yeah, you can. I can see the other people who are also grocery shopping at, like, 9.30 p.m., and, like, you can just spot kitchen people from across the room. Oh, just yeah. Like, yep, right pants, right shoes, slightly stooped. Looks just exhausted. got out of the shit. <laughs> <laughs> 2024 is uh, coming up, or I guess we're here now. This will be released then. You have a new restaurant coming up. Anything you want to share on that one? Slowly, uh, so, it's it's going a little slower than I thought, but it is over there, and we've got concrete poured, and it's starting to it's starting to look like a restaurant again finally. So that's exciting. How many times have you woken up saying, "Why did I get myself into this?" Oh, every day, every day, every day. Yeah, no, I mean it's a <laughs> it's a love hate. That's for sure. It's had its uh, it's had its hurdles to get over, and there's plenty more to go over still. But are the, a lot of the staff here at Station Eight helping out? Like, they're are they they're so involved? excited about it. Yeah, I don't know. They all have a. A pretty full schedule here, honestly. So I don't know how many of them will truly be over there, but they're yeah. all, yeah, they all, they all want to do something there so bad. What do you guys have going on for 2024? Anything exciting? New dinner series? New? I mean, we're keeping up the same dinner series. We're doing one a month. We're trying to cross promote. We're also always like keeping an eye out for the next venture, just because, like, our staff grows with us, and at a certain point, you want to like. Give them, like, keep it fresh for them. Give them something new to do, new responsibilities, like, new opportunities. Yeah, definitely. We'd love to someday find a bigger either space or production space. Um, and, like, down the road, we have other ideas and things we'd like to look into. But for this year, we're focused on continuing to grow Fiorito and work on improving our service and food and kind of staying focused on being better. I would say that like one of the things that's kind of like a hallmark for us is not that, you know, we've been perfect from, from day one, but that like every day we're a little bit better than we were the day before. And like Alex was talking about, we have dedicated staff members who are like, the Fagasha was good, but it could be better, right? And so it's kind of about pushing and guiding to do that and to make those changes. <coughs> and every time we do a menu update, so I mean, we're going to do another menu change here at the end of the month. I'm ready for some more of your guys' burgers. I don't know if, if you have you had I've a never burger really, there. Jeremy told, for, told me about it. We had one okay. together. There was, okay. dude, they are incredible. They are so good. Outside of the restaurant, nothing food-related hobbies. What do you guys do outside of the food restaurant? I'm hanging out with my wife, hanging out with our dogs, uh, pickleball. 
You play pickleball? Uh, yeah, yeah. These guys do too. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's play together sometime. Yeah, I should. picked it up in the past year. It's fun. Pickleball oh, podcast. I, I love it. Let's, just, let's <laughs> put on some headsets and just yeah. play. <laughs> pickleball. It's easy on the knees. <laughs> but my, my wife loves it. She, she got me into it, honestly. I was like, yeah, I don't want to go do that. But it's really fun. It really is. I played my first tournament last year and ended up getting second place. Oh, okay. You're good. Uh, I got to no. watch out for it's, you. It's recreational league, and I lost <laughs> to a pregnant lady and her partner. So, <laughs> whatever. But hey, I'll tell you what. One thing I learned about pickleball is regardless of your gender, shape, size, whatever, like there are people of all whatever that are excellent. Oh, yeah. The first time I played, I was like beating up with my friends, winning all these matches, and I played this older couple. And I'm walking in just ignorant, thinking I'm going to beat them. And they just <laughs> they put me to shame. And then they're like mentoring me and teaching me, and I just took it in. And so I'm like, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, it was great. It's I, funny I to watch it. it. Even at Chicken and Pickle, you look like to a few courts down, and it's like, that guy, guy has to be in his 80s. And then he's just hitting the ball like you've never yeah. seen. I mean, people get into it. They're good at it. I, I love it. And I'm competitive, so that I'll take that all day. I, it's okay. No, I agree. It's like a great blend of, like, competition and accessibility where, like, as long as you have, like, decent like hand eye coordination and are willing to practice like you can get pretty good at it and you guys are all, you guys still play frisbee golf i remember one time we talked about that i didn't play at all this uh. summer in kansas i played twice no three times in colorado uh which is not terrible i'd like to play more like once a week but i did three times this summer and i want to play more in like locally there's so many courses in wichita in kansas like everywhere I didn't even and know. when we did go to the ones in wichita a couple of years ago together they were so empty like you're just like dead. Yeah. Like it would be like us and like two other people out on the whole course. It was wild. It's probably been 30 years, or maybe 20 years since I've played last. Dang. So. Have you ever played? It's been a long time. I mean, well, not as long as that. It's probably been like five or six years, but I'd love to again. But it's kind of something I never think of, which yeah, I don't know yeah. why. But I think pickleball's taken over and not everything else. I mean, who knows? Golf. But uh, definitely we should get the four of us out. Pickleball is definitely the but sport, sport first. of oh, the man. years. Man. I actually have three rackets in my car. I'm ready to go. Whenever. <laughs> I got the pickleball shoes. We'll go over here to Riverside. <laughs> it's cheap and easy to make a reservation. Yeah. We do that quite a bit, actually. You can just get rid of all your seating and do a pickleball, pickleball court. court in here. Let's do it. <laughs> Station 8, pickleball. <laughs> God. God, you have the room. Just remove, <laughs> remove these that tables and right pickle. here. He's coming for you. I don't, know if, any, I don't know if anyone remembers when it was Jet, but you could play him in ping pong for your food. And like this wall behind you, Eddie, actually was full of signatures. Well, not full of. It was There were signatures on there if yeah. you beat him, and there weren't very many. But he, I loved him for that. John, Jet, he'd be in the middle of a lunch service. There'd be people in line, and someone at the front would be like, bet I can beat you in ping pong. And he'd be like, oh, Hold on a minute, everyone, and he'd leave the food line he's serving to come over here and play ping pong with somebody. He was good. He was scary good at it. Yeah, it's such an on the nose concept that like it almost should be like if you're like, oh, they're opening up a new barbecue and pickleball restaurant, <laughs> and you're like, Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> Switch talk Dude, for somewhere you. in the nation that's happening for yeah. sure. All right. Um, where can they find you guys? Address Oh, so they yeah. Out Sorry. I don't even know. Right here, man. I'm right down here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Downtown Wichita, 1100 East 3rd. Uh, we're at the corner of 3rd and Wabash. Wabash is just one block east of Washington. And we're at 3134 East Douglas, which is the corner of Douglas and Hillside, on uh, the northwest corner there in front of Dillon's. And we're open for brunch on Saturday and Sunday, uh, lunch Tuesday through Friday, and dinner Tuesday through Saturday. And uh, yeah, we'd love to see you. Come on by. Yeah, oh. we do a wine dinner a month, and the brunch is excellent. You have to go. Yeah, Alex. Alex is our most regular brunch customer. I, I'm gonna have You've to. You've told us about it. Hey, next to next time you go, let me know. I'll, I'll join you. Yeah, yeah, I have not done any, the brunch any given Sunday. Okay. So. <laughs> you want you want to share your hours, or do you think it'll piss people off? <laughs> if I do, I'll not share my hours. <laughs> it's, it's gonna piss, it's gonna off. piss me off. <laughs> we're, we're open Wednesday through Saturday from 11 to 2. Uh, How dare you? Only we three hours? outgrew our kitchen very quickly here. I mean, I mean, I'm, I think we served like 500 people last Saturday. It was, so. I, I took a picture of the line that this past it's Saturday. Great. And it that, was that line didn't die till we were just out of food and it's two o'clock and it's like i'm really sorry if you came in at like at the end of the day there's and not people even get pissed off about the line on top of the hours we're fa we're fast with yeah. that line honestly mm -hmm. i uh i mean you could call him a plant but we jokingly a few times have put a buddy at the back of the line and we're yeah. like how long is it going to take him to he gets to the front pretty quick for is what a job it is. is that a job people can apply for on <laughs> yeah, top sure. of like being yeah. here from six yeah, to three it pays with a two meat combo okay <laughs> <laughs> awesome well alex jordan jason i appreciate y'all hopping on thanks for having us yeah we'll yeah. do this again if not, we'll play pickleball. Or Always fun. Frisbee golf. Or we should do some pickleball. All right, let's do that. All right.
Thanks y'all for listening. Be sure to like, subscribe, follow all that crap. I don't know. I'm I'm getting out of here. We'll see you.